Recently I found out something very cool about the first movement of Chopin's third sonata. Musicologist Hugo Leichtentritt discovered that the first and second subjects can be played at the same time, and it actually works. Here's the imposing first subject on its own. And now the lyrical second. And here they are together with just a few minor alterations. Pretty cool, but surely a coincidence, right? Both themes follow the conventional four-bar phrase structure. Both themes contain two sharps. And both themes belong to the same composition, born from the same creative impulse. Is it really that surprising that they fit together contrapuntally? Well, to find out how rare this phenomenon is, I decided to test it out on a few other sonatas. Safe to say that most didn't work. In several instances, however, this ridiculous subject superimposition idea actually reveals some striking similarities, like in Mozart's famous Sonata Semplice. Or Beethoven's very first foray into the genre. Playing these themes together definitely doesn't sound good, but it does highlight their shared motivic DNA. Distinct though they are, these subjects have just enough in common to lend a sense of unity and connectedness to the works in which they appear. This experiment also highlighted the many sonatas whose second subjects are more explicitly derived from their first, like Haydn's 53rd, or Beethoven's Appassionata. This is a more economic approach to sonata, in which themes are transformed and reborn in new tonal and textual contexts. First and second subjects in these works are more like two sides of the same coin. Nonetheless, they still don't work when played at the same time. I've heard slightly better with Chopin's second sonata, if you allow the occasional uncharacteristic seventh. And Mozart's A minor wasn't too bad for about three bars. But by far the most successful example I found was Scriabin's third. Like Chopin's third, it employs a minor to relative major tonal scheme, and like the Chopin, its two contrasting subjects actually work when played together. Here's the assertive first. And now the tender second. And here they are together.
So this phenomenon is rather rare after all, but does this mean that Chopin and Scriabin knew about it? Did they intentionally imbue their themes with a secret kinship that's only revealed when said themes are superimposed contrapuntally? I wouldn't put it past them. After all, we are talking about some of the greatest musical minds to have ever existed. Or maybe it wasn't intentional, but the composers did it subconsciously. If you're working on a sonata, and you've written your first subject, then that material will influence every subsequent creative decision you make, including how you construct your second subject. It's not so outlandish to think that the creative process, which often seems to act of its own accord, may connect the compositional dots without our conscious oversight. Or maybe this is a ridiculous concept for a video and I should stop putting off my tax return. Anyway, I want to hear what you think in the comments. Is this yet more nerdy indulgence or is there something to this idea? Let me know. Also, we've covered a fair few sonatas today. Let me know what your favourites are. I'm curious. Thanks for watching and I'll see you soon.